Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Some of the best legendary figures from history are the ones shrouded in mystery. Where they came from and what their upbringing was like always seems to make them more human than myth, which makes us unable to fill in the gaps with our own embellished details. But little is known about Vincent de Groof. Some say that he was Dutch, others Belgian. He was born around 1838 and once worked as a shoemaker, but his ambitions took him much higher. Literally. Vincent fancied himself something of an aeronaut at the time, when many were exploring the skies. In the mid to late 1800s, aeronauts like Henry Coxwell and James Gleischer were setting records and making advances in the field of flight, specifically with hot air balloons. In 1862, for example, Gleischer and Coxwell reached an altitude between 29,000 and 35,000 feet in a balloon with a 93,000 cubic foot capacity the largest such vessel built up to that point. Vincent wanted to make a name for himself, like Coxwell and Gleischer. But a hot air balloon was only part of the plan. He'd also built a contraption, like something out of one of those Leonardo da Vinci notebooks. It was an ornithopter, comprised of a pair of silk wings and a silk-covered tail, all of which was operated by a series of levers that he pulled while strapped into the device. Vincent had given all the details of his ornithopter and his historic flight to the Morning Post, an English newspaper, which published everything with the following disclaimer. The attempt will not be more dangerous than the descent of a parachute. If only they had known. On Sunday, June 8th of 1873, over 100,000 people gathered in Brussels to watch Vincent take his creation on its maiden voyage. He had organized the event on the grounds of a local military academy, which had only been allowed because a lieutenant at the school had insisted on inspecting the flying machine beforehand. Vincent wasn't worried, though. In fact, he was so sure his ornithopter would fly that he had a program printed and handed out to the crowd that described how the whole spectacle would go down. First, he would flap the wings to propel himself upward and fly over the spectators' heads. Then, once they were properly amazed he would be lifted by a hot air balloon high into the sky. Once he was at the proper altitude, he would cut himself loose and soar through the skies in his homemade rig. Vincent's was nothing if not ambitious, even when reality did its best to keep him grounded. When the event finally started, two hours after its scheduled start time, by the way, he was only able to elevate himself a few feet off the ground, after which he face-planted into the dirt and damaged part of the ornithopter. Still, the minor setback didn't dampen his stubbornness to succeed. He simply carried on with the show, tying himself to the hot air balloon with a rope and allowing it to hoist him, barely a few inches into the air. The rope, you see, snapped, and Vincent once again came crashing back to Earth. The crowds were more than a little upset. They shredded his balloon in protest, and many in attendance were arrested for rioting. It took a full year before Vincent made another earnest attempt at flight, He chose London as the venue and brought a brand new flying machine with him, one that bore a striking resemblance to a giant bat. Its wings measured around 35 feet long and were made of silk, just like the last one. He tried a total of three times to achieve the kind of flight that he dreamed of. His first attempt on June 29th of 1874 saw him going up about 400 feet with the help of a hot air balloon. He was supposed to cut himself loose, but was still attached to the balloon when the whole apparatus caught in a tree. The second launch on July 7th was scrubbed due to high winds. Two days later, Vincent made his third and final attempt. Taking off from Cremorne Gardens in Chelsea, he hooked himself into his bat-like hornithopter while the balloon it was tied to rose above the city. Unfortunately, there was an error in communication due to Vincent and the hot air balloon operator speaking different languages. Vincent tried to warn him that he was headed straight for St. Luke's Church and its soaring tower. Someone on the ground shouted at the men, who prompted Vincent to cut the ornithopter free and coast to safety. The balloon operator, however, realized that he was about to crash into the church and tossed out three bags of ballast to gain altitude. Those bags landed directly on Vincent's contraption. The wings collapsed, 
and its pilot plummeted to the street below. 35-year-old Vincent de Groof died on July 9th of 1874. Very little was known about who he was or where he had come from, but he became something of a legend, dying while doing what he loved, even if his efforts did sort of fall flat. During the Great Depression, Americans converged on movie theaters to get out of their heads for a while. Hollywood hit its golden age, and people wanted to be amused. So for the price of a quarter per show, they could have a special treat and be delighted or scared by the films that we consider classics today, like Frankenstein, Dracula, or The Mummy. No one can resist a good scare. America already had a deep fascination with the great beyond, thanks to the influence of spiritualism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Clairvoyants, mystics, mediums, and psychics all promised to fill Americans' deep-seated need to contact their loved ones on the other side. Some were true believers, others were quacks, and many were downright criminal. But they all fanned the flames of America's enthusiasm for the supernatural, and with being scared out of their wits as well. But as people moved from the seance table to the theater seats, theater owners discovered that it wasn't just horror films that were packing in the crowds. It was the midnight ghost shows that had become a sensation. Ghost shows, also called spook shows or monster shows, were a combination of something very old and very new. At these performances, audiences could expect a night of creepy stunts and special effects that seemed supernatural, in addition to psychic readings, and other magical acts. One of the earliest examples dates back to France in 1798, when a Belgian named Etienne Gaspard Robertson used a magic lantern to project images that seemed to move right before viewers' eyes, nearly 100 years before the motion picture camera was invented. But it was someone else, a guy named Elwyn Charles Peck, who was considered the father of the Midnight Ghost Show. Sometime around 1929, he created an act that he called Elwyn's Midnight Spook Party, and drew on the tricks and illusions of his spiritualist predecessors. Teenagers loved the ghost shows, and whenever they saw advertisements for the performance pop up in town, they cheerfully trooped off to the movie theater to hopefully get their pants scared off of them. Onlookers were lured in with the promise of a good scare and shamed if they didn't take the bait. Girls were encouraged to bring their new boyfriends to see if they were courageous or cowardly. Most went together in groups called a spook party to better protect themselves when the ghosts swept into the audience or people were pulled onto the stage. Patrons shuffled into theaters, talking and laughing nervously as they found their seats. When the show would start, the house lights would dim. The host emerged, usually dressed in a costume that wouldn't look out of place in a psychic's gothic parlor. He would talk for a few minutes, priming the audience for the performance, and then he would step aside and introduce the rest of the act. The entire performance consisted of magic tricks, illusions, conjuring, and audience participation, and lasted about 45 minutes, followed by the inevitable yet sudden blackout at the end. By the end of the 1930s, these blackouts heralded the start of a horror film that would become a staple of the whole escapade. If you went to a ghost show at a drive-in theater, you might look out your car window to see masked and costumed ghosts, monsters and demons scuttling between the cars, popping up randomly to make unsuspecting audience members jump in their seats. Unfortunately, World War II put a halt to Elwyn and the other ghost shows that had begun touring during the Depression. Though people still frequently went to the movies, many teenagers and young men who participated in these acts went overseas to fight. Some assumed the horrors of war would drive people away from the horror genre altogether once they returned from Europe and the Pacific. But a funny thing happened instead horror film popularity exploded. Films like Frankenstein and Dracula were re-released, and sequels were produced as audiences embraced the terror with new gusto. Ghost shows found new life in the post-World War II. Raymond, really Raymond Corbin, operated the Zombie Jamboree, which toured from 1943 to 1953. In his shows, blood and guts flew as a mad doctor operated on a kicking and screaming patient, the terrifying scene ended spectacularly when a cast member waving a bone saw ran into the crowd to chop off an audience member's head. All magic tricks, of course. 
Ghost shows made decent money, too. Some troops pulled in almost $4,000 per night in larger theaters, more than $60,000 today. Through the late 1940s and 50s, it seemed like the ghost shows were riding a high that would never end. I mean, everyone loves a good scare, right? Well, just like video killed the radio star, it almost killed the ghost show, too. As television became more popular and as the gimmicks ghost shows relied on became less believable, people stopped going. A mysterious rapping sound and glow-in-the-dark paint weren't enough anymore. Slowly, troops disbanded and ghost shows disappeared, giving way to a new horror experience. Still, the spectacle and costumes became hugely influential on other stage shows like the rock and roll acts of Alice Cooper and Kiss. We probably won't see the return of the ghost show, but who knows? Trends are cyclical, after all, and there's always the chance we'll see people flock to the theater once again for a good old-fashioned phantomime. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.